thank you, Rasmus. That was mainly the, the main instructions now, and uh, I can give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. So now we're starting up and everything will be recorded, what you say and what you ask. Uh, so uh, people in the Americas can also see what's uh, going on. Um, as I said before, we have a group of great uh, experts on how to get the culture and creative industries on the political agenda. I will give the floor to Ragnar Seel. Ragnar Seel used to be uh, head of the Ministry of Culture in, uh, in Estonia. Uh, not the minister himself, but uh, right underneath. Uh, and uh, he's now uh, one of the founders of Creativity Lab in Estonia and also a good friend, a good advisor on everything that has to do with the culture and creative industries. Ragnar, you, the floor is yours to guide us through the next uh, hour or so. Very good. Thank you, Rasmus. Uh, it's such a pleasure to see uh, so many friendly faces uh, uh, this morning hour here, uh, all over uh, the world, I see people from from Colombia to Malta and even people sitting next door. So welcome. Really, we have a short time, so let's be uh, to the point as as uh, Diego was um, uh, was uh, instructing us. Uh, what we are so lucky today to have are experts in front of you who are not only theoretically going to explain their views on how to get uh, creative industries in the government's agenda, but who have actually in their respective countries done so. So I, I urge you to uh, take notes. Um, I know that some of you uh, uh, in your countries, because we, we work together quite a long time, have uh, managed to do so um, uh, quite successfully, and some of you are still struggling. Already back uh, eight, uh, eight years ago, when I was uh, 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 chairing the European Union expert group on creative industries, and when we did a, a mapping of the creative industries policy uh, scene in Europe, we saw a, a strange picture. Uh, the rules should apply to everyone. Uh, the conditions should be within European Union pretty much the same. But we saw that countries in European Union are in a very, very different footing. Some of them not only recognize the importance of creative industries, but as Rasmus was saying in the, uh, the, the question in the very beginning, have really placed creative industries in quite high uh, uh, in their political agenda. In some countries, people know about it. They do some studies. They are just scratching the, the surface. And then there were countries that have done very little or almost nothing at all. So why in some countries the awareness, the readiness to deal with creative industries is so much higher than another? That's the key question today. And Erasmus was uh, uh, phrasing the question this morning, how to place uh, creative industries on top of the government agenda? I understand that this is very uh, ambitious uh, plan. I think that for most of us uh, around today's uh, webinar, it's not a question how to place the creative industries on top of the agenda, but how to place it in an agenda, even in the middle, even in the very low, but at least in the agenda in the first place. Anyway, uh, we uh, start with our experts, their interventions. If you have questions, as Diego was mentioning, please do send your questions also in written form. We are monitoring them as, as they come in, and we will ask the, the, our experts those questions uh, as time comes. We start with Colombia. We start with Felipe. The floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you, Rasmus. Uh, greetings to everybody. Uh, I guess uh, the first part is it's communications. Uh, getting to to get a message across is is probably the most challenging thing you can do in public policy, uh, and there you have to be very creative. Sometimes, uh, of course, you have to to be familiar with your surroundings, your political system, and 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 the main actors. But that alone is not going to to get you very far. I mean, that can that can probably give you an opportunity here or there, but you have to make sure that you can uh, express what is necessary to be done in a creative way, in a, in a way that engages people, that mobilizes uh, people, that, that, that makes people imagine a future. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, 
to to raise uh, attention towards the creative industries and, and, and make change happen. In our case, what we did uh, at some point, uh, I was very lucky to to meet a guy in the IDB uh, several years ago, and the guy happens to be today's uh, president of Colombia. But in the process, what we did was to, to try to understand what it makes so hard for people who are not uh, creative industries enthusiasts, uh, people who are not uh, open-minded economists or alternative uh, policy makers uh, to understand the dynamics and the importance of the creative industries. So, so we took the risk of, of writing a book in a very uh, uh, unlikely fashion, uh, breaking up paragraphs, uh, just sending uh, small lines and, and messages connecting the dots and leaving the reader to use its imagination and, and in a way, uh, complete the book. Uh, that helped a lot to, to create, to raise awareness about the creative industries. We, we, we found that it was a very successful initiative. And after that, um, uh, we, we created kind of a movement without wanting to do so. And, and, and that group of enthusiasts today is, is, is the core of us being able to, to present policy, to, to push for reforms, uh, finding a, a crowd that is willing to, to spread the message and help uh, with the political system to move forward. Because it's very difficult to change the mind of bureaucrats. Uh, but it's, it's close to impossible to change the mind of politicians. So having a crowd and that helps is very important, and I think that has been a, a very special thing we have we have achieved. Uh, the book is called The Orange Economy. You can find it easily on, on the internet, uh, and and probably if you have not read it, once you open it, you will realize why it's, it's special in terms of making people. Uh, if not agreeing with you, at least, you know, give you the chance. And, and I think because of that, uh, we have been able to push a very aggressive agenda in terms of reforms. And, 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 and from that standpoint, uh, it, it, it's very weird when we're in policy making and something starts moving fast. Actually, you get scared because then you realize you are making um, uh, changes that are important, that can affect thousands of people, if not millions, uh, but it's very rewarding. Uh, and, and it's very important that if you want to keep your ideas honest, you take the time to write them down, uh, express them and communicate them. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, can I quickly ask you also a follow up question? Now, um, your book, The Orange Economy, The Economia Naranja, has really oh, very good um, Spanish. Uh, uh, has become really a, uh, a phenomenon, uh, not only in Colombia, but also in Latin America and in other countries. Um, what we've seen in other countries is that uh, the, a lot of focus in the very first steps in this process uh, is placed on raising awareness. Uh, get the building the alliance uh, kind of a champions around the theme uh, convincing people now you've done this you know uh, 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 incredibly how do you then if this has happened translate the awareness and and the the um, the inspiration that you've created into uh, uh, into action into tangible uh, because you know uh, you uh, have an example with uh, Colombia in one of the few countries in the world with a law on creative uh, industries of law on gray, uh, orange economy. How do you do that? What are the first few steps there? Well, you have to, of course, try to turn the ideas into alliances, as you have mentioned. And in that sense, you have to mobilize people. In a way, you are kind of a political entrepreneur. You have to, to sell the idea. You have to to connect with people uh, that sometimes you are not familiar with. You have to, to reach out across the alley, uh, find political allies in other parties, uh, but also to kind of make a, 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 an, an undefined alliance with, with people, with entrepreneurs, with uh, academics. And, 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 and you have to understand that many are not going to agree with you 
and, and, and the way you approach the topic, but many share with you the, the ambition of making creative economy happen as, as a policy. So, so, so there you have to start in a way negotiating with yourself and, and opening up your mind and making concessions, not in the sense that you are renouncing what you believe, but in the sense that you understand that there are way many interests that, that you have to take into account. Once you do that, uh, of course, it's very important to have leadership. In the case of Colombia, we have been very, very uh, uh, lucky that my co-author, uh, President Ivan Duque, was then senator as well. And, and a senator, uh, he was very skilled at, at, at making this, uh, this uh, Ali crossing and talking to other parties and other people with other ideas and, and bringing together uh, most of, 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 of what makes actually sense. Even if they are not your, your core ideas, you can respect them because of their, of their virtues and also include them into the policy. At the end, a, a political process is a, is a construction a negotiation process and you, you have to be very open to that and then of course is, is, is what you have to turn that leadership and, the, and those alliances into action so so you have to go and 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 and, and understand that uh, you are always looking for for the best right you want to to to, to everything to be perfect well uh, uh, sometimes the best is an enemy of the good so you have to make sure that uh, instead of waiting to have the perfect law or the perfect, perfect policy, to have a policy, a law that is good enough to, to, to make change happen. And then you take on and keep trying to improve as you go and, 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 and as you add uh, allies and partners and, and sometimes even enemies, they keep you honest. So you, you should not disregard the value of the people that disagree with you and to keep content, constant, const, const, constant um, contact with them. So, so you start by then, and, and then you, you have to start uh, reply, re replicating what you did outside of government within the government. So you mm -hmm. find the allies in the bureaucracy that will make all your dreams become true through programs and projects. So uh, always keep in mind uh, an open mind, you know, uh, an ability to, to keep learning from others, uh, but also never surrendering your, your core objective of making your, so your society a society that, that places culture and creativity in the center. So basically what we just heard was uh, a, a manifesto for creative bureaucracy. I will come back to these issues uh, very soon. Christina, let's move to Austria. Uh, is, coming from Felipe, is your policy good? Just good? Barely good? Excellent. <laughs> well, I would say first excellent, <laughs> but I guess I'm quite quite biased. Um, well, to give you some some insights about the Austrian um, agenda on creative industries, we have started already quite a while ago with um, supporting creative industries. Um, the thing is, one thing is that you have to like as a nation. I think we got to the term that. It is very wise to use the creative industries as some kind of dis like disruptive thinkers, especially nowadays that uh, globalization and digitalization brings so many radical changes in society. So, uh, and creative industries are not, we should not only support creative industries for the, for um, just to support the creative industries, but to use them for the wider economy, especially to use their transformative power for the, for, the, for the wider economy. And that's something that we tried to do already more than, uh, well, about uh, 15 years now. But it, it, it always takes time, that, that we can tell you. Um, because, of course, what, what uh, Felipe has already mentioned before, that, um, yeah, well, you have to work, raise, raise awareness. And um, there's a lot of prejudices about creative industries um, that have to be, well, uh, worked on. Um, how we did it was, well, basically there's two, two big things that, that uh, you can do um, in order to support them. One, of course, is monetary support. So that is something that we did 
um, already that we started in 2004. First of all, for them itself to, to develop new ideas, to be able to do that. But also um, one thing that has um, we have developed out of uh, an, an European project, the European Creative Industries Alliance, where you and I have been part of as well, uh, there we had the chance to, to install and, and test the pilot on creative industries vouchers, which is meant for, um, for SMEs from the wider economy to, to buy the service of a creative industries provider. And in order, this, the goal is um, to test, to be able to test, um, the, to test the benefits of working with creative industries and then in the later stage to, to hire them also for bigger uh, cooperations. And this kind of program we had, well, of course, within this European project, but we also had a national program running for several years. And the reason why we had that was to, to plant the seed in the, main, in the minds also of other Austrian um, company or uh, from companies from the wider economy in order to learn uh, about the benefits for working with creative industries. And the second big thing that, that could be very important or that we thought was very important is to have a strategic framework for that. So we have installed uh, in 2016 a national creative industry strategy built on um, three uh, pillars, which is um, innovation, transformation and uh, empowerment. And um, yeah, so one of the, one of the but one of the main goals is that we try to use the we, we yeah to try to, to use the the power of the creative in the transformative power of creative industries for the whole Austrian economy, and we do see quite some changes and we do see quite some changes that happen in the past fifteen years. Christina, uh, one of the big issues uh, in uh, how to get uh, the creative industries policy running in a country is who, who, uh, who, is, uh, who is responsible uh, for the strategy. Um, in most of the countries, in most of the experience, if, if you look around the world, and in Europe in particular, is that the, the, um, it has been the, originally the ministries of culture or departments of culture. And the, the struggle has been how to convince the people in, in the ministries of uh, economy, uh, uh, export, trade, uh, uh, education, because money is usually there. Okay. Now you are a different case because you actually work in the in the business development uh, branch. So maybe you can maybe you can give us few hints or tips. If I, I see that many of us here in, in in today's webinar are from the culture side, how to approach? What are the argumentation or what is the road to actually get creative industries? really rooted now within the trade or entrepreneurship policy? Mm -hmm. um, well, for us, first of all, the creative industries are located not in the cult Ministry of Culture. They are separated and they are uh, at the Ministry of Digital and Ec Economic Affairs, so the Economic um, Ministry. Um, the, you were asking uh, well, the, first of all, for the for the strategy, in order to to keep it maintained, we have a board that is meeting regularly, uh, and they are trying to, to to always to keep the to keep the strategy um, an active strategy. And but because you were asking about one example, what we could do as a region, something that we did uh, in Austria was, for example, to have to host a night of creative industries. It's like a, it was a fancy event to invite politicians. Uh, to invite also creative industries to present what they are doing, to, to give the politicians a stage, because people, uh, politicians like to shine, <laughs> and to, to, mm. to plant also the, the idea into their minds of um, how the whole economy could shine if the cooperation between creative industries and the wider economy would be supported further. But Christina, another follow-up just quickly, because I, I know that this is something that many people have on their mind. Now, people from the culture sectors or culture ministries, they, they work a lot to get uh, creative industries accepted uh, uh, by the trade commissions or, or uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, development agencies. But there's always a risk 
attached to this. And the risk is that when the, when the agenda is led by the uh, trade or economic or, or, or entrepreneurship uh, uh, departments, as in your case, then, uh, then some, they, they cherry pick. They, they like to deal with those parts of creative industries that, you know, that, uh, that carry more of an economic value, design or, or, or games or, or architecture or others. And they might not understand or like or deal with what we would call well, arts, uh, heritage uh, related, uh, uh, music, etc. How, how have you solved that? Do you in Austria look at the creative industries in the whole sense of creative industries or you have also cherry picked some uh, parts of it? Well, it is creative industries as a whole, but there is a big division between creative industries and cultural industries. So arts, most of them, would be put to cultural, indus uh, cultural industries. However, in Austria, it's not, in Austria we have uh, the cultural industries is a huge, huge sector. You know, uh, musicians, art theaters, this, this is big in Austria. The reason, the main reason, why we have separated the creative industries from the cultural industries is so that the creative industries wouldn't be outshined by the uh, so, so that they yeah outshined by the cultural industries because they are so big in Austria and okay. Austria is known as the country of culture, but this is probably a special case. So we 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 actually have to look for the take care of the creative industries more than for the cultural because. This, there's so much history for us for the cultural industries. Very good. Thank you, Christina. Let's move on. Well, when I opened up my eyes this morning, it was uh, snowing here in Estonia. Uh, now we jump to Malta, where Tony has opened up officially the short season. Please, the floor is yours. Well, I will not show you um, my short Please don't. Because that I won't. Um, so, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Um, Ten years ago is when, when I started working on, on the creative economy in Malta. And our story is very different because unlike what Ragnar was saying in terms of usually the culture ministry tries to pitch to the finance ministry or economy, in our case, it was the other way around. So we had the person leading the finance ministry, the permanent secretary, who truly believed in the power of the creative economy. And he was the person who kind of kickstart a conversation on the creative economy. So, so what really happened there? And back then I used to work at an art center. So what happened was a group uh, of economists uh, joined two cultural policy experts to devise a creative economy strategy. So suddenly my office shifted from working from an art center into a finance ministry. And that was kind of mind blowing um, because you could start seeing, so what was really revealing to me was that I always thought that being involved in lobbying and championing the arts, you know, required the necessary passion and, and uh, arguments that the arts matter to, to, to the country and the nation. And again, back then it was still an arts argument until you start understanding how other industries present themselves, you know, from uh, uh, manufacturing industry, tourism industry, because of course I started meeting these people around the table. And actually I noticed how poor the culture and creative industries were in presenting their arguments. And that was primarily because of lack of data or lack of any arguments. And first and foremost, understanding or accepting the fact, and this is still challenged, that it is also part of an economic model. And 10 years down the line, I can reassure you that there is still resistance by quite a lot of people. So my first pointer is that probably you will find more resistance from within the sector from, than from outside the sectors, especially from those operating mainly within uh, a strongly publicly funded subsidized culture, where probably any economic argument is going to be seen as a threat. You know, are you suddenly asking us or telling us that we will no longer receive our yearly subsidy or a three-year funding program because now we have to become a business. Uh, or, you know, uh, I'm a filmmaker, you know, I, I, why should I be thinking of my, my, my profits and loss and, and entrepreneurship and working within a cluster and, you know, thinking of, of uh, anything else? 
Um, so there is that kind of communication and also growth, which requires from within the sector. So I would say, even before thinking of building any alliance with any uh, political agenda, is actually building and growing that alliance from within and trying to understand who's in and kind of who's out and why. Um, and probably in a culture like ours or in a country like ours where sectoral representation is very poor, so you wouldn't find industries coming together to, to lobby collectively, to advocate for that sector. So in that absence, in that vacuum, it is only public policy that can actually um, fill in that gap. So when we started working on the creative economy, the, the actually it took us around three years to work um, on, on the strategy. And of course, working from the, within the finance ministry gave us wonderful access to a, a whole you know, economic department, to the National Statistics Office. Um, and it was very interesting because once we had, I would say, three sentences which actually mattered that, that spoke about um, the rate of the creative economy in terms of its contribution to the GDP or the gross value added and the amount of people working within that sector. And where we took the plunge and said, okay, let's compare ourselves to other sectors. Then we started meaning business because we started speaking the same language as any other sector. You know, that's how tourism speaks, that's how manufacturing speaks, that's how et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, we were working at a time when the conversation about the creative economy was, was kind of trending. You now, because political agendas, there's a trending going on there. So, you know, from the noughties until 2010, 20, you know, right, still, it was kind of, especially within Europe, you know, this kind of buzz. It became actually a buzzword. And although politicians were comfortably using creative industries, creative economy, loosely at times referring to cultural sectors, creative industries, you know, we opted for an approach not to divide them in terms, of, in terms of our analysis. We wanted to look at the collective because probably we knew that the economic or the most profitable area, when I'm talking about profit and, and, and the, the vast, the, the largest part component of the creative economy was more in the creative industries side, from design to software. Um, but it was important for us to also elevate the status of the cultural industries because that was also necessary. I would say 10 years down the line, probably we were more successful to elevate the status of the cultural sector than actually the creative industries. I, and I think that takes a longer time because in a way we were trying to bypass the, the other steps. So, you know, hand on heart, an art school is important for the creative industries. But in the absence of having an art school at a full-time tertiary educational level, you can't just bypass that and suddenly think that people are just going to create video games in, in a year or two. So we're kind of now filling in still those gaps, keeping in mind that ultimately political agendas tend to be short term, unfortunately. So that is always the struggle of public policy, thinking long term and having these short term. So our immediate reaction to this was first and foremost, having cross sectoral policies so, you know, trying to intervene in policies of other ministries. And again, from some smaller, in a way, token probably projects to put like small funding programs within the office of the president to have the cultural sector in this case more present. Um, two down outright um, uh, development policies. So for example, to, to give you an example now, like an example from, from the recent COVID measures, the culture and creative industries were the, one of the first sectors to be included in the list to be supported. Probably that happened because the National Development Agency, being part and parcel of this conversation, understood, or actually it came second nature to them, that this was a sector that was highly impacted by what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, probably that conversation would have been very different 10 years ago. Probably we would have gone down the line of, Ah, uh, you know, probably we have some hobbyists here dabbling a bit with art rather than actually this is affecting people's lives. Um, of course, I, I can't qualify this. I would need to research that. But in my conversations with, with them, um, it, 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 was, it wasn't a struggle. Far from it. Actually, it was practically already decided before even opening up a conversation. And my time Rasmus. is... Yeah, Rasmus. 
Tony, I just would like to ask you, would you say a bit crude that um, the cultural industries are the heavily subsidized part of the creative industries? It, dep it depends where. It depends where. In, in our case, yes. Um, but I come from a school of thought in terms of thinking of culture as also public good. So I wouldn't say that that is a negative thing. Probably there are a lot of areas which require public subsidy if we believe that education and health and et cetera, et cetera, is part of public good. If yeah, we have issues with that, then probably it's another argument. And the cultural sector is, is part of the value chain of the creative industries. Indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Indeed. I'll give Tony, the word to uh, Ragnar. Yes, Tony, you brought a, a very important case that, uh, that has been highlighted many, many uh, times around the world. And this is uh, building strong alliance within the sector. That it is nothing makes it easier for the government to reject the, the thought of putting creative industries in the political agenda while the sector itself is infighting. So you have to avo avoid you know, battles in two fronts. But one question to you, especially because Malta is a very, very small uh, place. And you know, as an Estonian, you can't say that often, that some other place is very small. Um, uh, we like the, being the role small, of, we're okay with that. The role of, of, um, of champions, the role of, of leaders, uh, you were the one with your closest group within the government that actually made a change, uh, uh, an impact. Now, when you leave and you left the government system, who fills the hole there? What, what happened? Who, who takes it over? Did you build a strong follow-up that even when you left, the government kept on going, or you see very clearly that with key people leaving the key position, you have to start over and over again from the scratch. There, there is always this risk. And hand on heart, I would say some things which we created in the strategy have disappeared because uh, change of people, change of administration. Um, others have kept on going. So specific projects like the design cluster that kept on developing should open up later on this year. From a policy point of view, and again, back to perhaps what also Filippo was saying, um, some principles are now embedded in law. So for example, one of mm -hmm. the first tasks there was uh, to, uh, to change the law of the Arts Council. So in our, in our case, the first step was to address governance. And the, the Arts Council, so the traditional notion of an Arts Council, has also been given or, or was given a, um, a remit for the creative industries within from a legal point of view now of course that changes you know according to different strategies so at times it's highlighted more than others and this really depends on on the specific leadership it depends on the, the specific ministries uh, involved um, probably at this time i would say that the economy part or the industry part uh, would tend to be more um, uh, open, perhaps. Uh, and, and I kind of see this also in other countries where, okay. you, you, I would, to be honest, I would opt to have uh, a, an approach where the creative industries are included in all forms of development policies mm -hmm. than other ways. I think I find that more effective. Okay, very good. We chop down to, uh, to even more south. We go to Kenya. George, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, it's a beautiful morning to see all of you. Um, and thank you for this invitation. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, what um, Felipe, Tony uh, have already created as a background for my presentation. Um, with a few variations. So I work with Hiva Fund, which is a, an investment company um, born out of a filmmaking collective, a multidisciplinary filmmaking collective. So my experiences um, uh, cover both uh, the practitioner's perspective and also um, a a private sector perspective. Uh, so I've been practicing for the last uh, 15 years in this space, um, beginning as a collective now to an investment fund that has uh, a participation of over 40 
um, companies in five countries in one region. Uh, that is covering Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. Um, what is unique about this uh, East Africa region is that it's very highly integrated. Uh, the median age is uh, pretty much 19, which is quite young as, to, as opposed to most countries around the world. Uh, the economies are uh, pretty small if you compare, say, to Western economy or to Asian economies. Uh, but uh, but 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 uh, there's a lot of um, uh, private sector participation in the economy. Um, and so our model pretty much is something between a think tank, uh, because we do a lot of publications, research, um, uh, guidelines, advisories for the five governments in the region. Uh, we also have a fund facility. Uh, so far, we have raised and uh, made investments close to um, $4 million uh, in the last uh, three years uh, in the creative and cultural industries. Um, and we also consider ourselves as uh, partners uh, to government. Uh, but this has not always been the case. So um, I'd, I'd like to, just for understanding, also say what have we achieved in, through public uh, partnerships so that then I can, I can go deeper into how we did it. Um, at the national level, we've been able to, in the last uh, five years, participate in numerous reforms. When Tony spoke about um, enshrining some of the uh, innovations within law is that we've understood that there's a very high turnover of officials who we've built in the past relationships with. And so we've moved towards looking at uh, institutional and legal reforms as how to at least uh, sustain some of our uh, innovations. So we have had a uh, review of taxes as far as uh, equipment and assets for creative and cultural industries are concerned enshrining uh, creative and uh, cultural processes within arbitration and um, dispute formal dispute resolution processes so that then we can affect um, uh, risk and, and, and how the creative industry, industry risk is perceived. Uh, we've been able to uh, support uh, the development of taxes, specifically earmarked for expenditure um, in the creative industries and in culture industries. Uh, in 2017, uh, we, uh, we worked for two years before with the um, government to create a tax on bet betting and gambling, uh, which would raise close to $15 million every year. And about 30% of this uh, is spent annually uh, on um, arts and culture programs across the country. Um, and that has sustained some financing regardless of the government of the day. Um, we've been also able to um, influence uh, the film policy, um, which uh, has effect on uh, uh, making film and film production and digital and, 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 and audiovisual content as part of mainstream economy. Uh, we've been able to um, reform the copyrights bill uh, to be one of the most uh, advanced in the region, to also look at uh, intellectual property as part of uh, monetization um, of culture, uh, including the payments of royalties to musicians, uh, using uh, um, uh, intangible assets as uh, collateralization for, for finance and so on and so forth. So we've tried to push a private sector agenda into culture so that, and enshrining that into law. At programmatic level, we've been able to sign many uh, uh, cooperation agreements uh, with government. Uh, the most recent one, uh, and this was uh, early 2019, uh, the government handed over uh, a market, um, public infrastructure 
uh, to the fund to be able to use um, the, um, our, our capacities to renovate and transform the fund, uh, the market into, into, a, into public infrastructure for cultural production, for fashion, for innovation, for youth. And so our, our relationship is not just um, looking to lobby government's actions, but we are also uh, looking to uh, take on some public responsibilities uh, and create them as centers of excellence uh, so that then if the government, if the president can launch these centers of excellence, it can start to show that we have new models for development. Um, and, and through this, we've been able to uh, take advantage of um, public priorities like employment creation, um, sustainable development, um, or gender mainstreaming. This, these large national ambitions to use those as um, uh, to promote culture and creative industries, as opposed to just using a creative and cultural framework. Um, what we've learned uh, out of this is that uh, first uh, we need to sustain our engagement. Um, it's not one-off activities. It would be uh, stemming across. Uh, different government departments, different agendas, but ha being a focal point. Um, and so we have employed um, for the last five years a government liaison office within our, our, our work that consistently involves, invites, engages with government. We invite them to our parties, we go to their events, and we build trust. And so as a result, whenever there is a conversation, we are always consulted. Um, and this is an institutional uh, innovation that we've had to employ. Uh, we've been able to call, convene with government conversations around creative finance, creative law, um, and creative activities. Um, we've also seen that it is, it's important for us to look at public sector priorities. Uh, so um, we've gone through um, uh, say uh, sustainable development goals, um, the World Bank is of doing business, um, and all these um, uh, indicators that the government wants to look good. And we say, what can the creative industries chip off out of this uh, national agenda? Sometimes it's um, leaning more towards the creative industries, and sometimes it leads more towards the cultural industries. And so by and large, um, looking at public priorities as an entry point has always allowed us to be at the table uh, consistently. Um, and over time, there is now an adoption of language within government. And we've seen very direct the language that we use to define culture and creative industries has systematically shifted into public language, into public sector language over the last few years. And finally, when it doesn't work, we've gone to court. Uh, we've used uh, litigation as a, as a, as a strategy. Um, so we realize big telcos uh, and government uh, are very reluctant to enforce copyright laws, which have a very direct uh, implication to artists' revenues and incomes. Uh, we've seen a reluctance uh, towards um, certain agendas that we have. Um, and so we've always used um, litigation, active litigation in court, supporting uh, artists to, uh, to challenge certain sections of law, certain, sec uh, certain decisions um, uh, through fair administration, uh, through enforcing of fair administration rights, and so on and so forth, um, to use the stick and uh, and also to use the carrot end. Okay. Um, so this has been our approach, um, and 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 we've uh, we're, we're innovating as we go. Absolutely, fantastic overview. And I I, I would just uh, say that from Tony's uh, intervention, uh, uh, building strong alliances, and what you mentioned, George, that you need to sustain that dialogue. That it's not a campaign. It's not one off. And you have to put effort in building that relationship with the government 
so that they could see you as a, as a reliable partner as well. Uh, Rasmus, I would like to go to you, back to you uh, for a second as well. I see that some questions are coming in also from, yes. uh, from participants, but also you have personally, not only as a chairman of the European Creative Industries Alliance formally, but also in, in Denmark, been very successful in pushing uh, creative industries in the government agenda. Maybe a few pointers from you as well before we go to the questions. Then it will be very brief. I think the, the big challenge is also to unite the creative sectors so that, because many of them have historically been supported by the Ministry of Culture, so they've been fighting against each other, trying to prove their worth and that, that music is more important than movies, etc. And uh, I think really to have a united uh, creative industries is one of the big challenges, uh, both in Denmark and also elsewhere. Luckily, we have the Danish Arts Council and Artists uh, Council uh, that regroups 24 different organizations uh, from uh, scriptwriters to uh, musicians to choir participants. But uh, that is uh, that's not the full um, the full scope of the creatives. We have two questions. One is they're both from, from German participants of German nationality. The first one is from Josefina Hage, and the other one is from Annette Rommel. And you're welcome to ask them uh, yourself, Josefina. Go ahead. Um, sorry. Uh, ah, you you can ah you can okay. Absolutely. <laughs> hello, hello. Good morning from Leipzig in Germany. Um, yeah, we are currently working within our network at promoting creative industries. It's a it's a network of over forty creative industries. Enthusi enthusiasts. I have to uh, uh, mention this <laughs> this term again. Thanks for that. Um, we are, uh, and also within the network Creatives Germany, we are working on a yeah, sort of a recovery plan for the cultural and creative industries at the moment and collecting ideas collaborati uh, collaboratively. So and recovery, I would recovery after the, 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 the yeah. unspeakable sea crisis. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, Germany has a lot of, uh, you know, immediate measures in place uh, from which also cultural and creative entrepreneurs can profit uh, from uh, grants, credits, etc. Uh, but it's obvious that CCI is among the sectors that is, um, you know, very heavily affected uh by, by the current crisis and it, yeah. it won't be over after the summer so uh, no. um let's, so let's we have, also take uh, let's also take yeah. the question from annette rommel at the same time um i know you can see them but annette if you want to uh, post your question yes hello to everyone um i have a question especially because i'm a student and a younger participant i would say and starting to get in the work life and interests in the cultural industries. So my question was how to involve youth and gender equality in creative and cultural industry policies. So that would be interesting. So, and since we have uh, six minutes left, uh, the speakers are, uh, or the panelists are welcome to take uh, either of the two questions and uh, what, what you feel most uh, comfortable with uh, to answer. Rasmus, there's one more question. And I oh, yes, there is. Oh, sorry. Let's ask that That's as well. specifically for Tony. Yes. And that is from uh, Arguro Barata. Yes. So I can't see you. I can see you there. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm coming from Greece and actually from Thessaloniki. And right now we are building an alliance between the cultural sector and we are all and we are already having this dispute about creative sector and cultural sector and how are we going to move forward. So in order to start preparing myself for these conversations, I was wondering if you have any practical advice on how actually to, to grow together and what, are, what work for Malta and what, um, you know, uh, what um, do you have uh, as an advice for me? Since we have five minutes, I just recommend uh, we will give now each one the, uh, the, the, the last round of words. But these are the most open and friendly people on earth. So please, after this, uh, find them on Facebook, write them and start the conversation there directly as well. They are open for it. Uh, but please, let's, uh, let's go back to Felipe. Let's, let's close this. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh very interesting insights from all the perspectives. 
uh, one of the things we have done with policy in Colombia that I think answers kind of all of these questions is uh, we have, I think in a way, a pioneered uh, an approach of transversal, transverse, uh, making transversal, I cannot say that word in English, transversalizing, uh, uh, culture as a tool for development. This is not as easy as, it is actually harder than to do that than, than to say the word, but what I mean to, with this is uh, one of the things we realized early on in the process of, of implementing policy is that uh, it's not about having uh, the creative industries with some sort of agency developing it somewhere in the government, and then you having to choose if it goes in trade, in digital transformation, or in culture. What we have done is we have created a council we call the Orange Economy, National Orange Economy Council, and we have 12 national agencies there, including seven ministries and five other agencies, including our national service for, for skills training and development, uh, our financial institution for regional development, uh, and uh, our uh, statistics authority, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of, uh, of ICT, the Ministry of Trade, the Ministry of Labor. And what we do by, by, by this transversal approach is, is we start developing capabilities across the board in different agencies. So instead of having to think about how we replicate everything from within a ministry, what we do is we create alliances from the Ministry of Culture with the ICT ministry so we can develop a digital agenda. We develop uh, alliances between the Ministry of, of, of Culture and the uh, Skills Development Agency so we can uh, improve our ability to, to train people for work. We improve our uh, relationships with the people in trade so we can also increase entrepreneurship. And we do so with not only the practical quote unquote um, elements of development, we also do that with the, with the social and inclusive uh, areas of the government. So we are working very close with uh, the women empowerment um, uh, presidential advisor and also with the presidential advisor for the inclusion in the participation of people with disabilities. And, and, and we are also working with the youth uh, uh, advisor. So, so we work with everybody that we need to work in order to make cultural development an integral element of our development uh, uh, model in Colombia. Yeah. Christina, Tony. Christina, please. Yep. Um, so thanks again for inviting me. Just I will just I will end with the two questions that were and I will answer very briefly. Um, the one question from Josephine um, in Austria: How we are trying to to support creative industries, especially now after Corona? This is what I think that it was the question. Um, we were actually having a yesterday a meeting with the board, um, uh, with the creative industries board. There will we're planning to to enlarge in the funds. Um, for that, that are dedicated for programs to support creative industries. So we will have bigger funds there probably uh, in, from next from the next year or this year next year. And uh, about the gender, uh, with our funds where we support creative industries, we give extra points to teams that are female or gender biased. So this is also a, a way to to support uh, teams that are either gender biased or female. Mm -hmm. So Very thank good. you Tom. again. Thank you, Christina. Tony. Okay, my, my reply to the question uh, on, on how to bring the public and private together. I think the first, the first um, task at hand was to bring them together on the same table. So, so working groups were created involving both the public sector and the private sector. Now, in the absence of having sectoral representation, such as associations or unions that represent sectors, um, that creates a bit of a problem. So, in a way, we, in the absence of that, we had to kind of pinpoint kind of specific champions for subsectors. Um, the second thing was from a public policy point of view, we've seen an increase in investment from public funding for culture and the creative industries from 0.4% in 2004 to now it's at 1.7% in terms of total public investment for the culture and creative industries. That came with a kind of agenda to strengthen the public sector, but also to make sure that this is also an investment for the private sector. So in a way, 
the, there was an understanding, thanks to the research we've done, that it is, it is useless putting all your money into the public sector because that comes with biases and bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea was to incentivize also the growth of the, public, uh, the private sector, also keeping in mind that the scope of certain public institutions are also there to work and service, to be of service to taxpayers' money to other sectors. Um, and, and the third point was also to develop new funding programs that would help the sector organize itself, but also instilling the idea of creative industries. So for example, a small creative industries platform program was created to support sector-led initiatives. Mm -hmm. Some are successful, others less successful. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think there's one approach. It has to be a mul multilateral approach to do this. Mm -hmm. Very good. And thank George. you all. George, would you like to also comment the last round? Well, I'm, I'm quite excited to uh, be part of this conversation. Uh, I've, I've left my handles uh, in the comment section uh, so that I can, uh, I can be responsible with this one minute. Thank you. So anyone with direct questions to me, uh, I'm happy to address them uh, later because I've seen the time is over. Very yes. good. Thank you. And thank you, I everyone, will... as well. And I will give the floor back to Rasmus. Thank you, Ragnar. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we will uh, share with uh, you, uh, everyone that has signed up for this webinar, will get an email with some links and also some, um, some um, LinkedIn information on the speakers. And also, we will have a LinkedIn group for anyone interested in creative industries policy. Uh, I can encourage you also to tune in again next Wednesday, the 6th of May, for uh, an hour on IP issues for creatives. And now here, the only thing that's left to say is to thank you to my dear co-host Ragnar Seel. Thank you also to Philippe, Christina, Tony, and George for contributing. And for everyone, thank you for tuning in. See you soon again. Have a good day.